the one. Yes. All right. So there is some magic happen when you click that link. What it's going to do, it's going to give you a few instance, but it's also going into our repository, our GitHub repository, where all the tutorials are, and it's trying to clone it for you automatically. Um, it's called Anti-Hit Puller, it's an extension that's awesome for teaching, but it hides a lot of the complexity that we actually want to teach you later. So we're going to do that on the first day, but after today, we actually expect you to know how to do that in the week, and we're going to address that, if I can plug my computer again. So why do we wait for OpenGL instance to spin up? Who here thinks Git is easy to understand? Who here thinks it's complex? Who here understood everything from yesterday's explanation about Git? They're lying. <laughs> <laughs> it is very hard, and it's fine to teach you. Right? It takes us a long time to understand it and try to adopt it. Uh, the next version of Git actually is improving a lot of the commands. So starting with 2.3.0, things are going to be a little bit better, more intuitive, but then we have to relearn re everything. So, uh, did you all spin up our instance already? So I'm the only one I need have. No, we're all not. Okay, good. Sorry? No, the machine type, I took the simplest one. I just picked the simplest one here. The link doesn't choose the machine for you. So, who here knows Matplotlib well? Well, who knows? Well. So, on this table, we have three. And in that case, if things happen in a way that other people need help, I'm actually going to ask you to spread and go help your PAs. This is very basic method. So those people that raise their hands are probably going to be bored. Instead of going on Facebook or Instagram, etc., stand up, go to another table and help your PAs. We just want to spread out now. It's up to you. I'm not going to ask you to actually do that. If you want to Facebook, that's fine. <laughs> Just pretend you're paying attention. And you're pretty much improvisation now because you know technology goes on. I use my computer and you say it's fun. These people have fun for jokes, like just come up here and no jokes. No bad jokes. Oh, I have one really, really bad joke about NumPy. Everybody here jokes NumPy, right? So you know the, the one about the guy that tries to import NumPy. And TSA said mod module not found. <laughs> Yeah, he was mad because he thought she was any deep random side. <laughs> That's bad, I know. That's it. Really That's the only Python joke they have? No, I have many Python jokes. Like, do you know why Python is better than C? Because it's a both C level. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, something is wrong. Yeah, it's like the same busy box. Who here actually got when Yeah, that's the feel. Yeah. Wait. Should we try to restart, Tim? Almost everybody's done. Just because if we get like five to ten minutes because it's spinning up the notes, and also I can repository it. Well, it's worked a minute before. Very fast. Yeah, but you can just everybody's done. Yeah. It's all right. Does anyone have any more jokes or puns? I want to talk to you. Oh, bad jokes. No. 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 So, 
So you know that joke about the mathematicians that went to the bar, and the first one ordered a beer, the second one ordered a half a beer, the other one ordered a quarter of a beer, and then the bartender, you know guys, you should really know your limits. <laughs> Yeah, I'm running out of jokes here. <laughs> so maybe I'll add that. Do we have one? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, so we have one for the audience. Two chemists walk into a bar. The first one says, I'll have an H2O. The second one says, I'll have an H2O too. He passed away shortly thereafter. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, where yeah, I'm an old guy. I use the old view. I don't use the lab. I'm sorry. And also because this is not my computer, it's not going to work on flight mode, and I'm not going to have the solution for the exercise. You have rice? Okay. But I don't, oh, I'm open to you. I'm not on your computer. So it doesn't work. No big deal. Like, I have all this slide show presentation prepared, and I have a lot of exercises uh, with the solutions. We're not going to do any of that. So we're improvising right now. So learning objectives. I actually want you to learn and understand how a computer on MathWatlet works. Why do we teach you MathWatlet? Uh, pretty much there is all this package out there, uh, and this picture from Jake Vanderpa tries to summarize all that. And you have these families of interactive plots, static plots, JavaScript based or OpenGL based. But to be honest, at the heart of all those is my project. Even those are kind of just connected, got inspired by my project or something. So you have to learn my project to go to the next level. However, my project is hard. For two reasons. One, it inherited a lot of MATLAB like syntax because it tried to make the way the migration easier. And second, because it's an imperative kind of way uh, of body. You tell it what to do plot dots on blue color and etc. 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 So usually your plots have many lines of code. The new ones, they have a declarative way of plotting. Who here is familiar with GG plot from R? A few hands. Yeah, it's more like that way. Like, you actually tell what you want, and the plot will be generated. What are the advantages of each? One is more customizable. You can make it really fancy and nice to my plot it. The other one is quicker, but kind of hard to customize. And your data needs to be prepared for that. We're going to see both approaches here. So this is the anatomy of a MathWatlet figure. I'm not going to go over all that. This is uh, from their own tutorial. So you have plots, markers, tick markers, files, lessons, and all that. And everything is customizable. And now I'm going to sit down. I hate to do this kind of thing sitting down because people don't really see me. But I want you to follow along. Everybody got their apprentice with this, right? Nobody's waiting anymore. OK. So first thing first, we have to use that magic the percent metropolitan line when you're on notebook. Yes. Can I do that, Jim? Yes. Command plus. Is that better? And also, you should be able to open this notebook uh, open here. You yeah, you should follow along. Yeah. Um, it's in the folder. Um, what is it? <laughs> this should help as well. Yeah. How can I make it full screen, Ujung? Basic visualization of the first step of the here on the top. Here? Yeah, uh, view. Yeah, that's all I do. Okay. All right. Is that better? All right. So on the notebook, we have to do the percent 
a method of inline to get the figure, the PNG figure inline of the notebook. However, if you're doing interactive stuff, you might use another backend. So you can try this later. No one should try it right now. We have the TK backend, uh, TK backend, and there's also a notebook interactive from the notebook backend, which will give you an interactive figure here. Okay. However, the inline is probably the best one to save and share notebooks because it's just going to be a plain PNG figure. The other ones will either pop up a window or you have an interactive figure that will last as long as the kernel is active. Mind that every time you change the backend, you need to restart your kernel. Okay? If I say something that doesn't make sense, like kernel, cells, or notebook, raise your hands on that. So when you say if you change the backend, if you change like what we're looking at here. Yeah, instead of inline, if I have QG5, I have to restart the backend. Okay. And then I have actual QT windows. It should be pronounced cute, but nobody said that. So it's end up saying QT because it makes cute graphics. Notebook. Yeah. So if you can try that. Uh, restart your kernel and try notebook. Okay. So a very basic figure. Um, sorry. Before I go, I forgot. We have some uh, convention support. If you're a diehard Python programmer, what we do, we sign this. It, they, they say that this is wrong. Like renaming a module is wrong. They don't like that. But it's common in our world. Right? So you're going to sell out of that. Just want to use it. So, so we have a few scenarios for NumPy, import NP. That was my joke, by the way. Uh, Matchbox, import PLT, and there are others. But if you find a new library, and try to be polite with our fellow programmers and try to support either the whole model, like from Matplotlib import Python, or if it's short, import Matplotlib. Okay? But it's fine to break the standards for data science and stuff. You're going to see NPL everywhere. Just don't invent something different. Like you can rename that. I can okay. import Matplotlib as my name. That's not clear, right? It's horrible code. Don't do that. So this is just to back the backend that we're using. So we're using the line one. If you change, you should get something different there. And let's go to our first figure. So the figure object doesn't do anything. It's just initialize the figure, right? And that's the repo for the figure. Repo is just uh, how the Python object is shown on the screen. It's more actually, but we don't really have to explain all of that right now. So figure alone doesn't do anything. We need to add some access. And with access, you actually have something, right? This is a blank access from 0 to 1. It's the default. But we don't want to create a figure and an access all the time when we're working with Matplotlib. We actually want to create them in one go. So Matplotlib has the subplots. Who here used it before? Awesome. So you're all pros. So you don't really have to do this tutorial. So you can create both the figure and the access in one go. Okay. And you can customize it. Like if you need subplots, you can put it number of columns and number of rows and actually the size of the picture. In this case, because I want them to have the square shape, I just double the width so I can have them with the same width and height. And let's do some actual data, right? So I have this uh, data from some buoys back in Brazil. And I'm going to use pandas to read it. Uh, who here used pandas before? Awesome, this problem is great. You don't really have to teach this. So there are some tricks to pandas to actually get your data cleaned at low time. And one of the tricks that I'm using, I'm declaring an index column. I'm telling to parse the dates. And I'm telling what value you should skip as not a number. Or this is actually a little bit hard with pandas. <laughs> And just break what not a number really means. Not a number is an I to believe float. And any operation of not a number is not a number. Not a number is not equal to not a number. And this not a number is actually NA, not available. It's a mask. Like we copied this from the R word. So this may be confusing for people that are using pandas for some computation stuff. Be aware. They actually have an integer, not a number. It doesn't really exist. Not a number is a float. So let's load that data, and we're loading straight from the, uh, the web. 
we have this URL with it. And now I'm gonna do some cleanup. So this cleanup is not uh, very conventional. So what I'm doing there, I'm accessing the columns and I'm using a string uh, operation there to actually name my columns in order by passing zeros. So my columns here were like one, 10, 30, and I'm actually padding for 0, 0, 1, 0, 10, 0, 30, okay? So I have them in a numerical order. That's pretty much the only thing that I'm doing here. And I'm splitting uh, a letter that I had at the beginning. I could use plus T, other score 1, T, other score 20, T, other score 500. So how about showing what it looks like? I am going to show, but the problem is because I have to fold the microphone get up and I, I So I, I'm explaining first and I'm showing later. So let's execute that. Yeah, we really needed the other microphone or the podium. So you see it's strings with uh, T1, T2, and etc. And after we do this, we actually have numeric columns, okay? And as you can see, because I told you to parse the dates, we actually have an index color with parse dates that has a mean dependence, that's a Python object. I can do actual date operation in there. So let's create our first plot. And here, I'm using the trick of converting that column string to a float, so I can actually have a z-axis. And that's our first plot. It's just a profile from that data, right? It's a temperature data. You can see like uh, it's a layer, and you can see the thermocline and all that. But what we can do better in that figure? We can add labels, right? So here I added a few labels and I'm gonna stop here for a moment. Who here doesn't understand how we're labeling this figure? But pretty much everybody's familiar with that. Just wanna know if I can skip this part or... So, you know, we can use uh, Unicode, we can use LaTeX code, all you have to do is declare a raw screen for that. And then you have Unicode mixed with graphic code. Um, there is one thing that we're doing there that's not nice. We are telling that the that is a negative, right? And we like it to be positive. But I did that on purpose to have it uh, in the right order. Is there a better way to do that? Does anyone know? Invert the axis. Invert the axis. Great. That's, so let's do that. So this is not inverted. So that's better, right? Sorry I'm so slow, I'm typing on a Mac and the Mac doesn't like me. So that's way better. Does everybody know this already? Am I preaching to the choir here? Or? Okay, we can also customize the ticks. So instead of having, uh, oh, sorry, here we go. Of having it be automatic, I can change. I want it to be zero, 100, 400, 600. And the tick customization can also customize the tick label. So not only the actual ticks. So instead of having numbers, if I'm creating a figure for a class, you know, for a lecture, I can put that surface in layer in our mindset. Right? You can put symbols from wherever you want. Oops. Sorry. Because I'm not on my computer, so I don't have this. So well, here's one exercise, um, and it's a mix of pandas and Matplotlib. I want you to create a plot that instead of uh, being a dead plot, it's going to be a time series, right? So you have to choose an index, and you have to plot it 
I'm going to give you what, three minutes to do that. If you can do it very easily, just put your blue sticker. If you're having difficult, use your orange sticker. And in three minutes, I'm going to do it my way, and we're going to compare what we did here. Right? Go for it. So it's not for you what it says there. I don't want you to do that plot and customize it because you all know how to do that. I want you to plot a time series set up for that plot, okay? Just because it seems that everybody knows how to customize their plots. So I'm gonna skip ahead. Emilio, you're taking care of the time. I found this on that one. Do you think that podium will work better? Then you can stand. Oh, yeah, that's better. Okay, great. Yeah. Let's do this. Because we're doing exercises, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, all, all the exercises, we're going to have that problem, right? But it's yeah. very can It is. Let's do this. I'll move that here yeah. and we can plug it. Okay. To be this window, right? Yes. Nope. Uh, this one. No, the first one is desktop, so it'll Oh, okay. The first one is everything. Yeah. Cool. All right. And how do I get back to the my um, window? Yes. Aha. You're there. Yeah. Oh yeah, that makes yeah, that works. If you can hear me, right? Oh, okay. Who got similar plot? Not exactly this one, but something similar. Yes. <laughs> Maybe two. So it can follow the middle. Yeah. Well, I have something there. Okay, does that work? Is my voice going to the microphone? All right, so. Who here actually use labels to find the proper depth instead of using indexes? When I use iLock, I'm using indexes, right? So I'm getting all the rows from the last column. Who here did that different using labels? Great, you're pros. Because you should never use what I'm doing here. You actually have them. Oh, you didn't? <laughs> okay, that's fair. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. So we can actually use labels, right, to, to do that. And then our code is more readable instead of using indexes. If you're coming from MATLAB, using indexes is natural. But on the Python words, it is frowned upon. Also, who here started a MATLAB figure 
instead of just using the dot plot. That's perfectly fine, especially if you're going to customize it a little bit more. But Pandas has a plotting scheme that is semi-declarative. It's not completely declarative, right? So I can use, and what is creating is a matplotlib figure. I can do this if I want to customize it. It's returning an axis. So I can have my axis object here, right? And I can customize it, add labels, change the labels. The main advantage of using pandas to plot is that I get for free an interpretation of the dates. And I get for free uh, a figure that kind of makes sense within the data frame. If you do this, Next, you have the help of everything that you can do or with the Pandas data frame. And we can be even more declarative. We can say X and Y, what you want them to be. So I can say here that I want, for example, X to be the first temperature series and Y to be, I don't think this works. I don't think we can actually say to get the index. Let's try. Yeah, it doesn't work. But I can't say to use everything else, but that's very confusing, right? And if I just don't declare anything, it plots everything against the axis. Sorry, the indexes. So I have here all the profiles against the indexes. And even got me a legend for free, but the legend is not very readable. So plotting direct from pandas can be easier. Yep. I lost the mic. Hello. Well, I guess it's off. Do we need battery? No, it's batteries. I guess we need batteries. Hello. Oh, it's back. Yeah, but it's low battery. It's not going to last. All right, Do, can you hear me or the mic is unnecessary for the streaming? It sounds great. Sounds great, okay. So some customizations. When you do the pandas plotting, uh, the legend goes wherever it fits. We don't want that. We want it to go in a place where you can actually read it. So you can customize the location of the legend. We can add grids and we can change the figure size. But if you notice, I'm actually mixing now the pandas plot and the access object is returned. Who here knew this already? Knew that you can plot with pandas and customize the plot? No problem. So pretty much every new uh, data model objects, pandas, X-ray, Aris, they have a plotting mechanism. And you can plot not only with matplotlib, you can plot with other packages as well. Well, like I said, we should try to be um, more declarative. So now I'm plotting with a label. So what I'm plotting there is not only, the, it's, not, it's no longer the first index of columns or row. What I'm plotting is the column named 001, which surface. It's one meter below the surface. Is that better? Okay. So it's way, way more declarative. You know what I'm plotting by just reading the code. I don't need a comment saying, hey, I'm plotting the surface. You can read the code and you can see, hey, it's plotting the surface. It's plotting one meter, right? And also the way I'm constructing the customization of the figure is a more readable way. I'm using the long names. People coming from MATLAB are tempted to use M instead of marker, like LN for line style instead of writing line style. And all these kind of things that I'm using there, it's harder to type but it's easier to read later. So when do you choose like plotting something like dot OB, it's gonna be like a point and a zero in a, a blue dot, basically, versus writing marker blue, marker type zero, whatever. So when do you choose one or the other? It's pretty simple. When you're creating a figure you interact with and you're just playing with, use the short version. When you're finalizing your script and you're gonna share, use the long version. And remember, tab is your best friend. Autocomplete works everywhere. 
So typing a long command is not, it's not that hard, right? As you can see, because you're all pros, I'm skipping and I'm kind of teaching best practice instead of teaching Matplotlib because you know how to use Matplotlib. Question, who here understand what's going on here? Raise your hand. All right. You raise your hand or just put in your code? I'll buy a beer for the person that can explain it that, or coffee, or chocolate milk, whatever you drink. No one? So there are gaps in this time series. There are small gaps and big gaps. The small gaps we can't even see, right? Because we're not zooming in. The big gap we can, that's when the, this buoy was under maintenance. And I want to interpolate the small gaps because we're just a few minutes. But I do not want to interpolate the big gaps. Pandas know about dates, knows about time series. So when I ask it to interpolate using time as a method, I can put a limit. I'm only interpolate gaps that are 10 minutes because my index is in minutes. This is very useful. Anyone try to do this on MATLAB? <laughs> it, no, I'm not kidding. It will be about 100 lines of code to do that. And I just did with two lines of code because I separated the options. If I actually hard code the options in there, it's going to be one line of code. And this is what happens if you don't, if you just interpolate. Connect, right? We don't want that. We actually wanted to know about the time frequency interpolate within that frequency. Who oh, here learned something new? Awesome. That's why we're here. So here's an exercise. Use the subplots and create two plots with the time series on a row. Right? Three minutes? Is that enough? I can stop whenever and I can, I can keep up the pace on the other one. Roughly. Uh, it's the other one, the, the 10, 10 minutes, if I just show, if I don't do the exercise. No, let, let's do it. Uh, some yeah. of them, like, um, um, the AUV will be quick. I know I can that. Yeah. And I'm going to skip because they know, they seem to be very knowledgeable in this work. There's always a challenge that there is, yeah. even if it's the first time people.
I'm seeing some blue stickers, which means that some people are done. Uh, it's fine to copy what I'm doing there. I'm just going to explain it. You don't have to stop. And if you did something different, it's great because then we can compare notes and understand the differences. So first thing, I kind of mix pandas plotting with metric plotting, right? I created my figure because I want two axes on the same figure. Who here knows about share X? And use that before. Great. If you're plotting time series or any other property that have a shared X, you should always use it. Not only because you get the data properly aligned, but if you are using interactive metaplotlib, when you zoom on one, it zooms on the other as well. I also have share Y, but I did not use share Y here because I'm plotting surface and 500 meters, and the scales are quite different. So I wanted to auto scale. So if I actually tried share Y, which is fair depending on the data and depending on what you're doing, here's what would happen. You pretty much can't see uh, the variability on the depth, right? So when I create the axis, then I can tell pandas to use that axis. And this is what I'm doing here. And because pandas, let me remove this line for a moment. Um, it just adds a the name of the index as the label, and I don't want that. Time, you don't need to describe time, and this was also in Portuguese, so that doesn't mean anything to you. We can add an empty label to make a better figure. Right, that's another trick. All these notebooks are shared with you later. Don't worry, and I'm actually gonna skip a few of the exercise, but I highly recommend you to go there and try them. And if you have trouble, find us later during the help desk hours in the afternoon. I'm just gonna skip ahead a little bit because of the AV problems that we had. This exercise here, I actually highly recommend you try because it's not only a plotting exercise, but it's also reading a horrible data in a horrible format, which is real life example. Sorry. That there were a couple of problems. All the uh, um, cells that have the load, no, yes. those will not run, right? Those will not run for you now because those are the solution. They will run for you after the tutorial because I'm going to push the solutions to the repository, right? What I was recommend is that you skip them or comment them out. Yeah, just don't try to run them. Yeah. Even I don't have them here because I was not able to use my laptop. So I'm pretty much coming up with the solutions on the top of my head, which you should never do. So I'm gonna skip that one, and I'm gonna straight for slices and surface because we have some modeling people here, and this is kind of important. So I'm gonna load uh, Ron's model using X-ray, straight up from, oops, sorry, from an opened up server. So you see that was very fast. It's not only because we are on Pangeo, but also because opened up servers are lazy. It only loads the metadata. It didn't actually load the data. So now I want to find the sea surface temperature. X-ray has this wonderful method that's called filter by attributes. And I can actually give you a standard name, a standard CF name, the Climate and Forecast Convention, and I can find a variable. So if I don't know anything about this model, but I know about CF, I can still navigate the data set. So let's see if I can find the temperature. There you go, found the temperature. So it returned me a data set with that temperature and all the coordinates and all the units and everything in it. Now, X-Array is pandas uh, for multiple dimensions. So we can do pretty much everything that we did with pandas. The pandas I lock, the index, index chain in X-Array is called I cell, I selection, I guess. Um, but it's a little bit better than pandas because I can actually use the names of the dimensions and use indexes. So I'm getting the first, actually the last time there, so it's the last time run, and I'm getting uh, the last sigma row, which for those who are familiar with from, that's the surface, that's not the bottom, right? And then I can actually create a plot, a surface, and you see I named my variable surface, to make that clear that I'm getting the surface. 
So I'm supplementing a deficient of not knowing what minus one means by naming my variables property. Good practice. Your variable names should be meaningful. So now I'm going to do a plot using X-ray that uses matplotlib, so it's layer on top of layer of abstractions. And I'm just declaring that my X is long row and my Y is lat row. For those who are familiar with from, that makes sense. For those who are not familiar with fromms, it's pretty much the latitude and longitude for the row variables. Temperature is a row variable. And there you go. We have a plot. And the funny thing is, this plot knows about uh, ge geographical coordinates. So it's not only a matplotlib plot. It's actually a cartopie plot that uses matplotlib. Who here heard about cartopie before? Awesome. So cartopie is used to make maps, and X-ray just did that for us. Let me do something here. Oh, the next cell does it. So we can actually do uh, the cart. The, uh, we can actually do some customization there. One of the customizations that I'm going to do here, I'm going to change the projection. And I'm going to create my own cartopi axis because I want to add coastlines. I'm going to run this again because the first time I run, it downloads the coastline data. So we have that warning over there. Now, because I have the data, if I run it again, I don't have the warning just to clean it up. So the main difference here, I changed the color map. I imported cartopi and I declared a projection. And then I saved the axis from that projection, and now I have the cartopi axis, which is a little bit different than the matplotlib axis. It actually it's augmented, it has more methods, and one of the methods is coastline. So I pretty much mix here X-ray, matplotlib, and cartopi in just a few lines of code. Very confusing, right? <laughs> but at the same time, very convenient once you master it. And who here knows about sea motion? Awesome, a few people know about it. For those who don't know about it, it's a collection of color maps for ocean sciences. They have a collection for, you wanna ask something or just? So it's a collection for ocean sciences that has temperature, salinity, um, turbidity, and all these biology and physical uh, quantities. It's, uh, I've never used sea motion like this. Is this because that color map is not available? No, no, they're all available, and this is, I did this on purpose. You can use CMotion motion as a standalone library, that exists, or you can use pellet table, which brings a lot of other color maps. So if you're not only in ocean science, but if you're doing something different, there is a lot of really nice color maps on pellet table. It's just another layer of abstraction. Who here heard about those uh, computer science videos from PBS? They're really cool, and the presenter keeps uh, using this elevator to go to another level of abstraction every, every video. There's about like 40 videos. It's awesome, you should watch it, it's like 10 minutes each one. But every time you move another layer of abstraction, they have this animation of the, the, she getting in the elevator and going to the next level. Like what we do is this, it's layer on top of layer on top of layer. How are we on time? Ah, you moving. Okay. So I'm gonna do a vertical section. And I'm also going to use X-ray here. And pretty much what I did here is um, I load my data. It's from Hycon. I selected salinity, I selected time, and I selected a specific longitude and a method of interpolation. Now, section ploy, plots. I actually had something on my slides that I don't have here. They're not easy. This one works because it's Hycon, and Hycon is Z, 1D coordinates. It's very easy, right? But if, if this was a sigma kind of model with the non-dimensional vertical coordinate and 2D coordinates like ROMs, where you have actually two points for each lateral on a curvilinear grid, this is really hard. There is a way to do it. Uh, I have many examples on how to do it here and here. Take a look at it or ask questions later, but I'm not really going to teach this. Uh, I'm not going to run the last cell here because it's not going to work because I don't have the data. It was on my computer only, but I'll definitely push this to the GitHub so you can use later. But pretty much what we're doing here is the same pandas plot, but instead of using matplotlib, we are using uh, HV plot. Actually, I can add that. Let's see. We'll probably do this. It should work. HV plot is going to be, we're going to see more about it tomorrow. It creates interactive graphs with uh, hover tools 
We can actually zoom in, pan, zoom out, and they have a JavaScript backend, and they use Bokeh underneath. So again, lots and lots of layers. But all you have to remember, if you want a static plot, use dot plot. If you want an interactive plot, use HV plot. Okay, that's what I had for MATLAB. Sorry for the HV problems. I promise we're gonna try to do better next time. Uh, should I go to the mapping or should I just skip it? Okay. You can uh, do it somewhere quick. Yes. So there is a second notebook that I'm gonna ask you to load. It's the base map in Cartopy. We're gonna do it very quickly. So who here still uses base map? All right, I have a slide for you. <laughs> so pretty much I'm gonna load the data, some data here. It's the challenger path data, which is a really nice data, and I'm gonna plot it using Carto, using base map, sorry. This is a fancy map, there are a lot of customizations there. I'm gonna let you extend it as an exercise for you to read it later. But as you can see, there's something wrong with that map, right? Something's happening at the date line. Lines are connected the way they should not be. So the reason for that is you should not use base map. Base map has an end of life announced it already. It's maintained for it's not maintained for years. It's just uh, some bug fixes, and it's gonna die in 2020 together with Python 2.7. So move away from base map as soon as possible and start using Cartopy. And also, if you're using Cartopy, that plot actually works the way it should because Cartopy knows about projections, knows about the date line. So it's the same plot, but correct. Okay, you don't have to actually deal with all these date line problems if you're doing global maps. And here's another example of how Cartopy deals with that. You can use the plate career, which is uh, pretty much unprojected, or you can use the geodetic, which is the projected way of doing things. So it connected the dots the way it should. I'm gonna skip this exercise and then this thing in the interest of time. I'm just gonna show some more customizations that we can do, like in a kinetic customize the tick labels, put them where I want. Cartopy has a lot of data kind of built in or search for the data. Uh, it searches from natural earth resources. And it has this stock image that's pretty cool. It has ocean and land. So we can make very simple, beautiful maps with just few commands. Um, I have some exercise on customize that, but uh, again, I'm gonna leave that as exercise for later. Just gonna run whatever I have here. Okay, one of the resources is Natural Earth. And Natural Earth has political boundaries, um, rivers, lakes, uh, coastlines. It does not have topography. So if you need topography, you actually need to read from another data source. And you can do fancy things like getting an image. This was a PNG. And we georeference the image in a very hack way, and then we can plot things on top of the image, right? So these stars here are a cruise that we did crossing that eddy. And people want to see that on top of that image that we have. It reads shape files as well. This is a shape file from GSHHS. It's another built-in feature on Cartopy. And Cartopy has one main advantage uh, when compared to base map. As you can see, it's taken a while for that cell to run it's because it's downloaded the data on the fly. Base map, it's huge, it's almost uh, 120 megabytes. So if you live in a country like mine, getting installing base map is really hard. But Cartopy is lightweight and it only downloads the data that you are requesting at uh, when you request it. So makes things like this easier. In this case, it's taking too long because I on purpose asked for the full resolution. That's why it's taking too long. But it caches the data. So it only takes long the first time. The second time is gonna be very quick. And I run out of things to say while we wait. I was really hoping the Panji was gonna be faster and this was gonna be done before I end my explanation. Yeah. I have trouble with Cartopy because, like, natural earth, when it does the background, when I try to overlay, like, images of satellite data on it, when there's missing data, I always have the blue ocean behind me. Okay, so you should not use this stock image instead. You Do you have a different image? There are. There are different, there are images with only land and only ocean. You should probably use the one with only land or vice versa, depending on, on, on what you have. Or you should color your lands. You can also do that instead of having them be transparent, 
have them be red, right? There, you, that's possible as well. Okay, so I asked for the GSHS uh, shape file. And as you can see, this is a very complex bay with a lot of features and looks nice, right? Looks great. But if you live there, you're pretty pissed because it's missing a lot of detail, like it's missing a big river that exists here. This is the problem with global data sets. So sometimes you need to read local data that you collect yourself. And we can mix CartoPy with GeoPandas for that. And here I'm gonna read a shape file from the same region that I have here. Who here knows about GeoPandas? Just a few. Those who don't, you should definitely look into it. Makes your life way, way easier when read, reading shape files and GeoJSONs and stuff. So I just read that shape file. I'm gonna select the geometry and I'm gonna plot that on CartoPy. As you can see, now I have the river in there, right? Because this is local data, someone actually collected data. And uh, who here had this trouble before with global data? Yeah, it, you're probably trying to use non-US regions, right? Because in the US, GSHS works great. It's only outside of the US that things get complicated. But as you can see, this doesn't do, right? Like people want to actually plot samples, uh, there are sample locations here on the river and it was going to show them on the land. That's just wrong. We can reproject the data and I'm going to do a very simple example here where we had the WGS84 uh, for this region. So this is UTM. We can use PyProj and convert that to light long. And then we can plot on CartoPy, but here I'm doing both. I did the PyProj reprojection and I'm also doing the reprojection using the CartoPy built-in feature for that, just to show that they match. So you don't really need an external library. And that, as you can see here, they match. They're all in the same position, right? So this is the CartoPy way of doing it. And it's very similar to a Proj string. Who here is familiar with Proj strings? Just immediately. That's actually the fact, oh, and child, the fact that you don't know it's great because project streams are hard and annoying. So you don't need to dig deep into that. Use the higher level interface. Use CartoPy or PyProj. So all you have to do is to declare a globe, a datum, this, the UTM zone. Uh, UTMs by default North M series. So if on the South M series, you have to declare that as well. And there you go. It's converted. All right. Any questions? Um, if you start up a little bit, like when you're, I don't know much about Cartoon but like when you're creating this figure and accent object, mm -hmm. it's already in the Cartoon it's already like a Cartoon object. Yes. So how would you, you, how would you go about having a subplot where one of the subplots needs to be an abstraction, but the other one is like a random one? You have to use plt.axis for each subplot and declare a different projection on each subplot. You can't do together. Like when I do this, I'm using this function make map, right? I actually forgot to say this, so it's nice that I go back here and show it. When I created the make map, I'm kind of reusing it a lot. You probably noticed that I'm reusing for different maps. You should try to do this as much as possible. Create functions, right, that will help you. Um, I lost the cell where I did it. Create functions that you can reuse. Like this one. So because I can only declare one projection for each axis, if you're doing multiple axis, uh, you need to create plt.axis projection one, plt.axis projection two, and then join them on subplot. All right. So is there any way that we can save the final plot? So, for example, for roles, you would normally need to have a coastline, right? Yes. And like, I could definitely use that as a coastline and like that to interpolate my data and use that as a. Oh, you, you want to get the lat long for, for the. Coastline data. Yeah. It's possible. I, it's definitely possible. Or, well, on a shape file, it's way easier, right? Because you actually have lat longs in there. Um, the natural earth is a shape file, but you can actually hack the axis and get that. I have a notebook on that on my extras. I'll show you later. Okay. Um, yes. Uh, 
actual lab bounds data. Yeah. Like whenever I try to plot the work data, uh, because the lab bound data is uh, is manageable, I get restored the state of the plot. Uh, the southern part is okay, but the north part is like you see very big green land, very big. Green land. Well, you have you have to change your projection, right? You need to change your right, choose the right projection for your plot. Uh, I always have uh, trouble because, like, uh, we have three axes. Uh, the lat long data is not very strict, like in regular lat long. Uh, we have a uh, lat increasing up to some point, and it sticks, and then uh, both lat three and long three are magical. Mm -hmm. Because it's a yeah, there is an example of that in the Cartopi gallery. Um, I didn't show, but I have some links here for galleries from our resources, and like the Orca models, like that, if I'm not mistaken. So they have an example for the Orca model, and they show how to do that. But yeah, it's non-trivial. Do you want to start?